to Rusty and to Andrea. My name is Julie Barrett O'Neill and I'm the executive director of the LISC office in Western New York. For those of you who are not familiar with us and wonder what that acronym means, it's a local initiative support corporation. And like all good nonprofit names, it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue, but it is absolutely capturing the mission of what we do. LISC, um, excuse me, works with community organizations, business groups, and residents to link neighborhoods with the tools and the resources that they need to thrive. We're an intermediary and we work to pool public and private dollars, work with local partners um, and institutions to support people in places. LISC has got a dedicated mission um, around uh, helping to close the racial wealth, health and income gap within our region. And we have a particular focus around housing as one of the key social determinants of health. Housing um, and the physical environment has been attributed uh, with up to 10% of your health outcomes and uh, conditions. And LISC's 2020 strategic plan identified housing as one of our four major goal areas. Um, our work there is to facilitate the development and implementation of a community owned. And by that, we mean the people who are most impacted by affordable housing um, uh, challenges and housing insecurity and a comprehensive uh, plan that really drives public investment and addresses the complex relationship between our homes, our businesses, our neighborhoods, our work, our health and our planet. We are grateful to have had an opportunity to partner with uh, the Partnership for the Public Good on this particular project. Um, many of my colleagues across the nation have uh, recently, uh, or in my small tenure here with LISC, announced very bold and audacious initiatives to address affordable housing in their communities. Most, most re recently, I believe it was a $40 million initiative um, out of Virginia. Oh, I'm sorry, out of. Uh, the Southwest. And um, we would like to do similar scaled work here in the Western New York office, but we wanted to first ground truth that in a deep understanding around what it's really going to take to solve the affordable housing challenges in Western New York. Very often we look at these issues on a municipal basis. Very often we highlight the challenges of one or two locations. This is a regional issue that's being affected by regional forces, including development in the suburbs and different jurisdictions and different funding sources. And so we were delighted that the Partnership for the Public Good uh, joined forces with LISC and worked uh, closely together for a regional housing market analysis. I want to hand things over to Andrea uh, O'Sullivan quickly to have her just quickly give an introduction from PPG's perspective. Thanks so much, Julie, and thanks to everyone for joining. Um, as Julie said, I'm Andrea Osulava. I'm director at Partnership for the Public Good. We're a community-based think tank and around 315 partners in our network from Buffalo, Niagara. Um, I see many of your names in the attendees list here. Um, and for years, our partners have brought to us um, of housing affordability, priorities, challenges, strategies that they wanted to advance together. Um, and we've had some successes in that area, other reforms that partners wanted to see go through at different levels of government that have stalled. Um, and I think one challenge we've seen firsthand is when we come into meetings and say, we need this solution, we need to take this strategy, there was still quite a lot of difference on whether um, different actors and different stakeholders felt even that there was an affordability challenge in the first place, right? Or what, what level is it at? How are neighborhoods changing? Um, and I think the COVID-19 crisis in the last year has, has brought us to more common ground of understanding there certainly is an affordability and stability challenge across the region. Um, and I'm grateful to Rusty and Jason for this study, to Julie as well for her leadership on it, um, because I think it's so important that when we come to the table to find housing affordability, short-term and long-term solutions together, we have this common understanding of where we are as a starting point. So that's really how I'm looking at this study. Um, it's a great source of information so we can build that common understanding of where we are today and what the most important um, challenges and opportunities are for the road ahead as well. And I'll turn it right back to you, Julie. 
Thank you, Andrea. And I just want to quickly take one moment. Um, we're very lucky that instead of having to go outside of the region for um, individuals with a deep understanding of the complex data sets that um, really help us develop a full picture of what's going on with housing, um, that instead we had great local experts here within our own community. Um, Jason Knight is with the uh, Buffalo State College, Department of Geography, and Rusty Weaver is with Cornell. Um, and we, uh, they've been doing a number of different research projects uh, relative to housing, including projects uh, con connected with uh, the consolidated plan, as well as a rent research project. We've provided links to both of those studies on the LISC website uh, that was uh, used to advertise this event. Um, but at this point in time, I think that for because we've all been waiting to see the uh, and or hear the results of their analysis, which um, were were really uh, breathtaking for myself when I got a preview. I want to hand things right over to Rusty and Jason to kick us off. Um, we will spend some time at the end of the session. Uh, with questions and answers, feel free to put pieces in the chat. I apologize that not everyone can see the chat, but we will make sure that we um, uh, gather the chat and also report out during the session. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to Rusty and Jason. Thank you, Julian, and thank you, Andrea. Um, so I'm going to share my screen here. Um, if you could just give me uh, maybe Julie, you're the only face that I can see if you. OK, perfect. Um, so like Julie said, my name is is Rusty Weaver. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Dr. Jason Knight, who is a panelist on this session. Um, we ran into some scheduling issues and didn't know if Jason was going to be able to make it. So unfortunately, you're going to hear a lot from me over the next uh, probably about an hour um, with with Jason jumping in a, a little bit later on, especially when we get to questions. But um, as Julia and Andrea were both saying, we were brought on to look at some questions related to housing affordability, supply and demand issues and gaps um, as they exist today and potentially as they're going to exist in the coming decades. And so we're trying to get a sense of the challenges that we have right now and what may lie ahead so that we can start to design uh, an action plan around meeting some of those challenges head on. And so uh, Jason and I took this um, opportunity as, as really a fact finding mission that we're out there to try to dig into data as deep as we can and present the scale of the problem, the locations of or the scale of the challenges, the locations of those challenges and set course for the next phase or, or what we see as the next phase of this study, um, you know, getting into making some some data driven informed decisions based on the findings here. So that's kind of how we'll approach this. Um, it is a lot of data, so I'll, I'll say. Um, just to prepare you for that, um, you know, we, we normally try to keep these things relatively small, but we've got about 40 slides of, of results for you here. And um, that's only scratching the surface of what's included in the report. So we're trying to hit the high notes, get to the bottom lines, and then get all of your feedback so that we can create a final version of this that will be um, available through LISC's website. Um, so to kick it off, um, for those of you who were able to join us when we did an interim version of, of this presentation back in, I want to say it was January, so a few months ago, um, we uh, many of us got together, many of you here probably, and Jason and I presented on what some of the, uh, the findings at that point in time in the study were, some of the big challenges that we saw. Um, and so to avoid repetition, that entire video and presentation is available on LISC's website for this project. So I'd highly encourage you to go back and check that out um, if you want to see how we got to these big picture items. But I'm going to start off with some of the bigger conclusions that we reached during that presentation and build on them the way that we do in the final report. So the first thing that we tackled was we tried to create a demographic and economic profile of the region. Um, and identify key trends and then needs and challenges that came out of that profile. So I'll start off with a uh, democracy. But the big things that we saw at that point in time and noted um, were that we're, we have an aging population. So we looked at trends um, across really the last 20 years, um, looked at how the age profile and the age composition of the region was changing by municipality, um, even you know, drilling down to the census tract level in some of the analysis um, to show that we have a, a population where householders, heads of household, um, are, are aging in place. And so we're going to see that recur as, as a theme throughout the rest of this report, how aging is going to impact the housing market and the housing situation. 
the, the housing and demographic profile is that we have a spatial mismatch. A lot of the housing production that we see is either you know, in luxury housing inside the city of Buffalo or newer units that are predominantly in, in outer ring locations and suburban locations that aren't well connected to jobs, public transits and, and other amenities and services. Um, so we're almost adding to the sprawl of the region through a lot of patterns of development, and we're increasing the level of auto dependence that already exists here in the region. So those were two of the big conclusions that we reached, and now we want to, to project that out and look ahead it's to, to see if these issues are going to become more problematic as we go forward, um, and if so, maybe what can we do about it? So to do that, um, when we were given this project, part of the scope was to try to project out um, LISCWA and PPG were interested in, in looking out through, let's say, the next three decades to about 2050. And so we have to rely on a lot of secondary data sets to, to do that and um, you know, gather information as best as possible. There's a lot of uncertainty involved in projecting out population. Um, and so one of the sources that we look to, we use two predominant sources to project out population over the long term. One is from this acronym that you see on your screen, PAD. So every state um, has a partner, an official designated partner with the Census Bureau to do population projections. Um, in many states, it's a, it's a state demographer. Here in New York, um, our population projection um, entity is Cornell's Program on Applied Demography. So that's that acronym PAD. And so what those entities are charged with doing is creating long-term population forecasts based on demographic changes, birth rates, death rates, and patterns of migration. Um, and trying to think about how recent trends and current um, tendencies in those three phenomena are going to uh, set us up for population growth decline or, or stasis over time. So currently, uh, our official demographic projections for New York State, which only go down to the county level, go out to 2040. And so be being that we're a two-county region in Buffalo, Niagara, we can look at the regional population projections out that far. Now, in 2010, our most recent decennial census count will be getting for counties um, our 2020 census results soon. We just don't have them yet for counties. But in 2010, we were at about 1.135 million people in the region. Um, Cornell, uh, our state demographers, our, our state population projection experts project that we're going to see you know, relatively slow but steady population increases through about 2027, when the region is, is due to hit a, its next peak of you know, about 1.153 million people, after which point in time we're going to start to see a, a slow and steady decline. Now, the reason for that um, is, you know, as I'll get into more in the next slide, is that the population is already mentioned aging. Um, and so when you have an aging population, you tend to have a drop in birth rates. And so we're getting into this uh, phase um, in our regional development where uh, death rates are projected to outpace birth rates by a relatively large amount, which is going to lead to population decline. Um, and that's population decline that's occurring naturally. So if we don't have huge influxes of in-migration, we're going to see this sort of downswing in population again in the near future. We want to project that out further. So if we look at the annual average rate of population change after that peak in about 2027, if we just say that let's assume that continues, um, then we, we may fall by 2050 um, below where we were in, in 2010 at the last census. Now that's a, a big may, right? There's a, a lot of buts that are involved with um, you know, just applying a, a, an existing rate of change to that data set. And so we do want to bring in, um, we do have another official uh, regional entity that uh, is charged with making population projections, and that's the our, our Metropolitan Planning Organization, so the Greater Buffalo Niagara Regional Transportation Council. Um, and so in their more of a, a relatively slow linear increase to um, really almost, you know, close to one point, um, uh, close to around 1.6 million, uh, excuse me, 1.16 million people, if I remember correctly. Um, and so in reality, we, we might expect a population in 2050 somewhere between these uh, these two extremes, but those are, are the forecasts that we have for our region right now. So we're either going to see um, a peak in the late 2020s, followed by slow population decline, or we're going to see relatively slow and steady growth um, you know, over the next three decades. But at any sense, uh, none of our projecting entities are expecting the region to grow rapidly. And so that's, of course, going to have implications for the number of housing units that we need for what the housing stock looks like. Now, the reason for some of those more, I, I won't call them dismal, but some of those flatter projections on population is you know, due to that uh, finding that we already mentioned that we do have an aging population. Uh, so back in 2010, the median age of the population in our region was about 41 years old. That did drop. So we had 
um, I, I won't call it a youth movement because the median age only dropped by one year, but in the ensuing years from 2010, we did see median age fall slightly. But now, if, you know, using those Cornell population projections, that's it for the next few decades. And again, what that means, median age means that half of your residents are above that age, half are below it. So um, by you know, 2040, when our median age is, is estimated to be around 44, that means over half of the population is 44 years or over. Um, and so you have relatively low birth rates with a population at that age level. Um, and you know, on the opposite side of the spectrum, you tend to have slightly higher death rates. And so that creates this natural tendency toward depopulation, toward population contraction. Migration is expected to, to tick up and to offset some of that natural population de uh, decline, um, but it's going to be a, a number of years, at least based on current projections, before we start to see um, you know, substantive influxes of, of people, substantive net migration of, of let's say, a thousand or more people per year. Right now, and in the interim in Niagara County, um, the uh, demograph the demographers at Cornell are projecting that we're still going to see um, net out migration, so net population loss through migration through about 2029 or 2030. Um, in Erie County, we are experiencing net in migration, but at relatively low levels. And so again, population uh, in, is expected to increase by way of migration um, in the coming years, reaching you know maybe even about 3,000 people per year out to 2040. But that's still a, a long time coming, and that's relatively small compared to the natural demographic change through death rates exceeding birth rates. Now, what this doesn't account for at all, this is based on um, empirical observations of, of recent mobility, of recent um, mobility of people in and out of the two counties. It doesn't account for the possibility of climate-related migration, which is something that we need to seriously think about here in the region. Um, though uh, we don't really get into that with these numbers, um, there's enough uncertainty involved in, in projecting out population, you know, three decades uh, from now using just demographic factors and mobility patterns. Um, you know, the possibilities that surround climate-induced migration um, are a little bit beyond what the, the data allow us to, to reveal yet. And so that's something to keep in mind, that migration might be more extreme than what we're seeing here with these projections. But still, you know, based on most accounts, not enough to offset this what's population loss after we we sort of peak around you know 2027 to 2030. All right, so um, where is this growth happening? Well, using the Greater Buffalo Niagara Regional Transportation Council's projections, uh, we can look at you know relative to <coughs> excuse me population levels that come from the Census Bureau's most from 2015 to 2019. Happy to answer questions about what that means after the fact, if, if you're interested in the data. Um, but if we look at uh, the data of, of what the population is right now based on current census estimates um, versus what it's projected to be using um, the GBNRTC slightly more optimistic population projections of slow population growth through 2050, um, a couple of trends emerge. Um, one is that there's relatively dispersed growth throughout the city and in most of the first ring suburbs. So in, in many of the locations where we have density, where we have access to jobs and other amenities. Um, in the outer rings, we tend to see relatively static populations, you know, less, less change, um, except for a few uh, sort of outlying communities that are expected to grow. Similar patterns occur around Niagara Falls with some growth projected in the city. Um, and then relatively you know, static or stable populations outside. Um, so we, we do have areas where population loss is projected to occur uh, more, with more intensity, um, including um, several communities on the east side of Buffalo, and then in some of the first ring suburbs, and even some of the outlying communities are expected to contract a bit. Um, so you know, what does that mean for, for housing? Well, it means it, it gives us some sort of indicator of um, if we take an assessment of, of what the housing stock is today, how many units we have and how many units are likely to, to survive um, over the next 30 years, um, it allows us to think about whether we're building in the right places. And again, if you go back to that video from our interim presentation, uh, my colleague, Dr. Jason Knight, made a pretty convincing case that a lot of the, the new builds that we've been doing in the region um, have been dispersed outside of, of these pockets of growth. They've been in more so in the areas that are relatively stable in population or even contracting potentially by 2050. Um, and so that creates somewhat of a spatial mismatch between where we might need units and where we're, we're building units. So that's an issue to as we go forward. Now, another one is um, neither Cornell nor GBNRTC projects out 
population um, and breaks it down in any way to understand the composition of that population. It's it's more looking at total numbers. Um, with the Cornell projections, you you get a breakdown by gender, but not by say race or ethnicity or or um, other population subgroups that that might give us a handle of you know say uh, what types of housing we need where. Um, to do some uh, some estimation uh, to try to fill in those gaps. And so one way that we tried to handle that for Buffalo Niagara. Um, is that the United States Census Bureau does do this exact thing. It projects out growth in populations by race ethnicity um, and to, to try to, to show a changing picture of how the population composition may change over the next 10, 20, 30, or, or even in the Census Bureau's case, 40 years. Um, and so what we did was we looked at those national level projections. Um, and so for the US as a whole, total population between 2020 and 2050 is expected to grow at about a half a percent per year on average. Uh, but that's not even across the racial and ethnic subgroups that are tracked by the Census Bureau, which you know, the, those definitions have their own problems, the way the Census Bureau tracks uh, um, tracks these metrics, but you know, we'll, we'll have to work with that framework for right now. And so with that being said, um, pretty much all of the population growth that, that's accounted for up here in the Census Bureau's estimates comes from persons of color. The population that identifies as white, not Hispanic or Latino, white alone, not Hispanic or, or Latina, um, is projected to, to de decrease over the next 30 years, um, while all other population subgroups tracked by the Census Bureau are projected to increase. And so what we did for Buffalo Niagara, taking those uh, census tract level, those fine geography estimates from the GBNRTC data set, um, for each census tract, we computed the overall or average growth rate um, for the population in Buffalo Niagara for each census tract. And then we use this framework here to create multipliers. Um, based on the racial composition of that census tract today, we created multipliers to project out growth by race ethnicity using um, the, the Census Bureau's national level growth figures as, as the starting point, as the benchmark. And so when we do that and apply those um, locally adjusted growth rates, to the racial composition of the neighborhoods that we have um, here in, in Buffalo, Niagara. Um, what that shows is, again, the GBNRTC data projects slight population growth between now and 2050, adding a net of about 20,000 people between uh, those two points in time. And all of that growth is, is accounted for, again, applying these national level projections to local data. Um, all of that growth comes from populations of color, though um, the majority population that's been the majority for so long here in the city is, is contracting. Um, and so that has implications for housing. Um, you may think that this is a demographic exercise, but why this has implications for housing is that there are empirical regularities that, that exist um, that might lead us to different, different types of decisions based on which populations are growing and, and which are not. Um, one thing that we can think about, which will become a, a greater topic as we go forward in this conversation, um, is you know due to um, a legacies of inequitable systems of access to housing, of exposure to lead and everything else, um, there's an empirical relationship in the region that's that population that's shrinking, that's declining, the white population tends to be below average in having um, all of the types of, of physical or, or mental difficulties tracked by the Census Bureau. So having um, a disability, the white population tends to be below average in their uh, predisposition to these types of disabilities that are tracked by the Census Bureau. In our, in our full report, we have uh, definitions, the Census Bureau's definitions of each of these categories, if you're curious. Um, but the Census Bureau does track six different types of disability, and in all cases, except for one, um, the, the white population um, is below average in, uh, in its relative frequency of, of um, being associated with these types of difficulties. And so what that means is that the populations that are projected to grow, again, because of this legacy of inequitable systems and inequitable access to healthcare, um, tend to be more likely today to be associated with these different difficulties. And so this is deterministic. And, and so I'd say appro approach this with a, a healthy amount of caution. But if we assume that these same patterns that we see today play out in that future population, that projected population of 2050, um, then what that means is that we're going to have increases in the number of, of persons with these diff six different types of disabilities in Buffalo and Niagara over time, um, between four and six percent increases in all of these categories. And so that creates a, a, a new need, a, a new type of housing unit that we have a, a woefully inadequate supply of accessible units right now even. Um, and the implication is that we may need even more of those units to accommodate um, growing subpopulations of persons with disabilities. 
So that's one way that a, a changing population composition can affect what we need, um, you know, our, our current housing gaps going forward. Another is, and this is again just an, an empirical regularity. Um, it's something that that is subject to change over time, um, uh, of course. Uh, but right now, another thing that we can think about is is household size. Um, the shrinking population, again, the population that's projected to decrease over the next thirty years, tends to be associated with some of the smallest average household sizes everywhere throughout the region. I'll talk more about this geographic framework when we get to housing in just a moment. Um, for now. Uh, what we can do is just match these sort of weird numbers and, and sets of boundaries to these column headers um, over on the left hand side of your screen on the table. They're called public use microdata areas, which is a mouthful to say. Um, there's a reason why we, we have to look at them and have to use them so that we can get access to some more fine resolution data on people. Um, but I, again, I'll have more to say on that framework in just a moment. For now, what we can say is in just about all of these areas or regions, um, again, the population that's uh, on pace to decline over the next 30 years tends to be associated with some of the smaller household sizes and some of the population subgroups that are expected to grow most quickly, notably um, Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, Hispanic or Latinx individuals, or persons who identify with other mul multiple racial identities in the Census Bureau's racial and ethnic framework, um, they tend to have the highest household, average household sizes. And so again, while that is subject to change, um, there's been a lot of sociological research that talks about why those patterns tend to exist and, and talks about why they've been fairly durable in history and why they might continue to be durable into the future. And what that means is that if we're um, you know, seeing growth in certain populations that have higher average household sizes, it might mean that we don't need to build as many units as we think we need to, to build to accommodate a growing population. So that's another way that changing population composition can affect what we build or don't build um, in terms of our housing landscape. All right, so that's again scratching the surface. There's a lot more that's um, a, a lot more detail that we go into in the report here. But out of the sake of time, and and again recognizing that we have about 30 more slides of of, of data to shove at you here, um, we'll, we'll take a pause from some of these demographic uh, characteristics and move on to economic characteristics. And so just like we did at, at the start of the last one, I'll start off with two broad points that we try to make and reinforce throughout this presentation. And then we'll go back into the evidence that actually leads us to these conclusions. So the two broad points that, that arose out of our economic profile is that this is a region that's characterized by low income and relatively stagnant wages um, and high income inequality that's, um, that has a lot of intersecting dimensions to it when you when you consider race, ethnicity, gender, um, presence of, of disabilities, and, and uh, several other factors that we can track. So to start off with just the regional picture, um, Jason and I uh, tend to use HUD's framework for creating categories of, of income. So um, HUD, in terms of program eligibility, tends to look at three types of low-income households based on um, the household's family income relative to area median income. That's what AMI stands for here. Area median income just means median income for our area, for the two county Buffalo Niagara region. Um, and so with HUD's definitions, they tend to distinguish between extremely low income households, very low and low income households. Low income households earn 80% or, or less of area median income after adjusting for their family size, so the number of people in their household. Um, very low income households earn between 30 and 50% of, of area median income and extremely low income households are those that uh, whose families, family incomes are less than 30% of AMI. Um, now, technically HUD does use a formula to get this and it's not always 30%, but it tends to be 30% most of the time. And so for ease and, and for an operational definition, we just use 30. Um, and then what we do is we create on the other side of, of that, um, almost the equivalent categories for, for moderate and, and high income. And so when we take a look at the income distribution in Buffalo Niagara using uh, these definitions, the modal category as you would expect, you know, given that a, a median um, is sort of the center of, of your distribution of data, the most common category is moderate income. So meaning that you know, uh, families earn between 80 and 120% of the area median income, but we tend to have an overabundance of households on the low end of the spectrum after that. So you know, for those of you who were um, you know, taught in, in high school that's you know, grading on a curve, usually uh, grades have a bell curve where you have a lot of mass at the middle of a distribution and then relatively small tails at the end. Um, income is not distributed normally. It doesn't have that bell-shaped curve. 
um, it tends to look often more like a W with uh, a lot of mass um, at the edges of the distribution and some in the middle. So um, in the case of Buffalo, most of our, our mass, so the preponderance of households are located on the low end of the distribution. In fact, nearly half of all households in Buffalo and Niagara could qualify as low, very low, or extremely low income based on their family income relative to area standards. You know, by, by comparison, only about a third of households are um, you know, at 120% of AMI or higher. And so, you know, we often have this perception that Buffalo is, is this middle income city, um, a, a, a blue collar city. But the, the reality is that this is a, a low income region where we have nearly half of all households qualifying as, as low income or, or lower um, based on their family size, family income, and what the area median income is, as, as again determined by HUD. Um, when we break this down by region, these again correspond to those you know, odd public use microdata areas that I had mentioned before. Um, these two are here for the city of Buffalo. And so when we look at the city of Buffalo in particular and isolate it um, on the east side of Buffalo, so this 1205 represents all the area east of Main Street, really including South Buffalo as well, 70% um, of households um, earn low to extremely low income. On the west side of Buffalo, so west of Main Street, the number is 61 and a half percent. So, um, you know, this is is very much uh, the profile of of the city of Buffalo and the region is that you know there is relatively low income, which is going to create issues in terms of housing affordability, especially as we'll show later in a hot housing market or a seller's housing market like we are experiencing at the moment. Um, now, here's an overwhelming graphic for you, but this is that breakdown. This is the income breakdown by region or by subgeography in the two county region by race and ethnicity. And so what I'll do for you is just highlight the two largest demographic groups in the region. So this box represents the, the white population, white alone, not Hispanic or Latinx. Um, and so you can see the shape of the distribution in most uh, subgeographies. Um, kind of does follow that almost normal distribution that I was talking about, where you see a peak in the middle and then, um, you know, sort of smaller tails on the sides, but usually um, with an uptick at the end in that, you know, very high income category. So that tends to be the case in most of these public use micro dis, uh, data areas, with the exception of the city of Buffalo, which is, uh, you know, the purple and, and the pink graphs here. Now, by contrast, the second largest demographic group, so for Black or African American headed households, you tend to see instead of that um, almost even, almost symmetrical with this upper tail distribution, uh, you see almost a, a downward sloping ramp in all of these locations. Um, and so that's going to be true of, of most other demographic groups as well as you go through this. So we try to break this down and explain this overwhelming graphic a bit more in the report. So I'd, I'd invite you to, to try to read more about that. Um, once uh, once LISC um, publishes on their website when we have the final version. But the idea is that we have really different income profiles here depending on race and ethnicity. So um, that's going to, to create, uh, again, specific issues, intersecting issues for income inequality. If we want to summarize all of that information and that overwhelming graphic pretty succinctly, we can just look at the, the, the likelihood that somebody from a household based on the head of householders race, race or ethnicity qualifies as extremely low income. Um, and in pretty much all cases across the region, um, you know, compared to non-Hispanic white headed households, um, Households headed by Black or African American individuals are 2.7 times more likely to be extremely low income. Households headed by Hispanic or Latinx individuals are three times more likely. Um, and households headed by Indigenous um, householders are 3.4 to 3.5 times more likely to be extremely low income um, than their, their white counterparts. And so that's one way that that's, um, income inequality really plays out by race ethnicity in the region. Gender is also a big factor. Um, so when we look at households headed by males versus households headed by females across the region, female headed households are about seven percentage points more likely to be extremely low income than male headed households. Um, and some of the most extreme cases actually occur in the suburbs. So this um, public use microdata area 1207 is the South Towns. Um, and so there, female headed households are more than twice as likely as male headed households to be extremely low income. So. Now, with all of that being said, that's kind of where we are right now. If we want to think about how those trends or how those inequalities are going to play out in the future, um, we need to think about how the economy might change. And so to do that, we can take a look at patterns of, of job and wage growth over time um, and try to situate 
that intersecting economic inequality into the changing economy and figure out if it's going to get better or get worse, or at least make you know speculate on whether it's going to get better or get worse. So if we do that, um, one of the uh, most widely used data sets to look at patterns of job change in the United States is the U.S. Census Bureau's. Um, uh, it's the LEHD, it's the loc uh, Location Employer Household Dynamics Survey. And so that tracks the number of jobs basically down to the census block, the finest resolution geography that we have for census data. And so we can you know, re-aggregate them to any sort of unit of analysis th that we want because they're relatively small. Now, there is a lag in that data. If you're going to collect data that fine resolution, it takes a while to do it. And so the most recent uh, set of data that we have there is for 2018. And so if we want to understand uh, patterns of job change over the last decade. We're kind of limited to stopping there at 2018, at least for right now until new data are released. But that gives us a sense of, of what's been going on, what the trends are. And so in all of these public use microdata areas that I've been talking about, um, you know, with a, a few, a handful of exceptions, we've seen job growth. And that's kind of what we like to boast. That's what we like to see uh, or what the newspaper headings like to say is that you know we're in chart we're overseeing job growth in Buffalo Niagara. It's all about job growth. If we get more jobs, then we're going to have more income, um, and people are going to be better off. That's not always the reality, though. Um, you know, whenever job growth happens, it it can be good if the jobs pay well and provide benefits. If they don't, then job growth can worsen problems. And so, if we want to look at how even you know ignoring um, the, the three areas where we experienced some marginal job loss perhaps over the last decade, if we assume that job growth is, is something of a phenomenon that's dispersed across the region, you know, we should expect or hope to see a lot of increases in wages, that there's more money to spend if we're, if we're creating more jobs. But all of these lines, um, these represent data from tax returns, income tax returns from the IRS over the same time period as this uh, changing job profile that I just talked about. Um, it's adjusted for inflation, and what we tend to see is in each of these public use microdata areas, relatively flat lines, right? And so what that's saying is that while we've had job growth, we haven't seen a lot of growth or a lot of change in the wage income that we have to spend. Um, there's one notable exception here that I'll talk about. So if you can follow my laser um, in the public use microdata area for the west side of Buffalo, 1206, you have seen this sort of uptick. And so that doesn't mean that everybody there is, is now you know, all of a sudden earning higher wages. Instead, that's more reflective of, of what we've come to see in um, academic studies and newspaper headlines and on the ground, um, that that's probably more reflective of gentrification and wealthier individuals buying units and or renting units and, and moving into the region. So that's kind of the one exception where we do see this distinctive upward sloping curve, but elsewhere the, the curves are, are mostly flat. And to put some numbers to that, so you don't just have to take my word for it, um, in that period of time between 2010 and 18, in New York State, the annual average gro um, growth in wages or wage and salary income, again, based on this IRS data, was about 1% per year over that time. Now, if you're thinking to yourself, you know, I've, I've heard that living wage, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, cost of living increases at work or cost of living um, bonuses are, are generally around 3% per year. Um, right, the, the data show differently. That's um, cost of living might be increasing by 3% per year, but on average, wages in New York State are only increasing by about 1% per year. Um, in our region, it's even lower. It's about 0.68% per year over that uh, period of time from 2010 to 2018. Um, in some places like the east side of Buffalo, this public use microdata area 1205, it's half of, of the statewide average of about you know 0.49% per year. Um, and again, in uh, the west side, like I said, it's it's much higher than the state or regional average, and so that's probably more reflective of of wealthier individuals coming in and, and driving up housing prices and, and housing costs than it is of the folks who are already living there making higher wages. So that's something to pay attention to. Why we're interested in it and paying attention to it is if you look at some of the real estate market giants like Redfin, um, they show that over this period of 2012 to 2018, which is their um, you know, most recent set of data that aligns with this, you know, Census Bureau jobs data, um, that housing prices or price per square foot of housing in Buffalo, Niagara has increased by about 4.3% per year. Wage, wage income during that time, 1.15% per year. So housing prices are increasing about four times faster than wages, which is going to put a lot of pressure on, on households in terms of housing affordability. All right, so Again, we've we've been talking about income inequality, whether it's going to get better or worse. 
um, the relatively stagnant wages that's, that we've seen in recent years is one reason to, to think that maybe income inequality um, is going to get worse before it gets any better. If we try to put that in context and project out what's going to happen, um, the GBNRTC data that we use to make population projections by, by small area inside the region, um, they also have uh, projections for job growth over this time. Um, so a lot of job growth is, is expect most job growth over the next you know, three decades is expected to happen in relatively dense areas um, in the city, in the surrounding first ring suburbs. Um, in the predominantly residential outer ring, you don't see a whole lot of, of projected job growth, except in a few places in, in very um, you know, southwest Erie County and, and up in um, more rural Niagara County as well. But you know, for the most part, job growth is projected to happen in the city and around the city of Buffalo, um, with a, a smaller degree of, of urban job growth in Niagara Falls. What kind of jobs are we expected to create? Well, using the New York State Department of Labor's long-term job forecasts, we did something similar like how we broke down um, the population projections from GBNRTC into population by race and ethnicity. We used some projected growth rates from the New York State Department of Labor for our Western District, um, applied them to the GBNRTC job growth forecasts or, or projections through 2050 to try to break it down by industry. Um, but the, the long and short of it is, without getting into an industry by industry analysis, which is pretty cumbersome, is that the industries that are expected to grow in Buffalo, Niagara over the next, you know, let's say two to three to uh, two to three decades um, are predominantly low wage industries. So across all industries for this Department of Labor data, jobs are expected to grow at about 0.7 percent per year. The industries that are double that are administrative support and waste management, arts, entertainment, and recreation, accommodation, and food services. Together, we tend to call those two leisure and hospitality, um, and then healthcare and social assistance. So at least three out of those four industries tend to be associated with relatively lower wages. Um, healthcare and social assistance does have a, a slightly higher income profile than the other industries, as we detail in, in the report itself. Um, but many of the jobs that have been created in that industry are, are you know, lower wage jobs as well, support jobs or social assistance, social services jobs, um, which you know, notoriously don't really pay um, uh, enough for the, the work that goes into those positions. And so if we're seeing most of our job growth in relatively low wage industries, the implication for housing and economic inequality is that all of those trends that I just tried to play out um, a few slides ago um, are on, on path to, to potentially worse. Um, and so that brings us now to housing cost and affordability. So finally, after all of this profiling, we can think about what these changes actually mean for the housing landscape that we have um, and what it's going to take um, to alleviate things like cost burden and unaffordability issues for our population that exists right now in Buffalo, Niagara, and how it's projected to change going forward. So to get into this, this is the one thing that I will repeat from our last presentation for those of you who might not have, have tuned into that, um, are, are just some definitional elements here. So housing cost burden, um, this is a, a definition that's kind of just been absorbed by analysts over the years. Um, you know, whether or not it's the best definition, I'm not here to, to die on that hill, um, but it's the definition that tends to be used for a lot of federal programming and to identify populations um, who might qualify for housing assistance. So housing cost burden um, exists, uh, it, at least by this operational definition, when a household spends 30% or more of its available gross monthly income on housing. Now the question becomes what income is available for housing? Um, and so there are two uh, ways that the Census Bureau tracks income um, for a housing unit. One is household income, which is the total income of all household members who are 15 or over. Um, and the other is family income. So it's the total income of the head of household and all members of that household that are related to the head of household by blood or marriage um, or adoption. All right. And so these two different definitions have led to differing uh, sets of results in the literature because they, they're not the same. Right, family income, uh, you know, with household income, you might have roommates who are living together. Maybe they don't pool all of their income for housing. Um, instead, maybe they just all agree to, to pay a certain fraction and that's it. So um, in that sense, we would overestimate the, the number of dollars that are available for housing for that unit. Um, and so for that reason, family income has, has tended to be the preferred by uh, source of income for many housing analysts um, because it's a, at least, you know, the um, organizational 
organization equitable growth says it's a better measure of standard of living, but more practically, it's also the measure that HUD looks to when it's considering housing assistance. So in order to qualify for HUD funding, one of the first steps or, or threshold tests that you need to pass is that you have to meet HUD's definition of a family. And so HUD is generally looking at family income when it's determining program eligibility. And for that reason, all of our analysis here on out looks at family income. And so that's why we have this weird geographic profile that, that we've been working with, these public use microdata areas. Um, in order to really get a sense for um, you know, what family income is uh, for residents of Buffalo Niagara, um, how do we adjust it for household size to account for the number of family members or, or number of household members there are in a family unit, um, and how that relates to things like race, ethnicity, presence of persons with disabilities, um, and all of those other indicators that we'd like to track, we need some fine resolution information about people, and that information is, is privatized by the Census Bureau. Um, the Census Bureau does take preserving anonymity pretty seriously, um, and so recognizing that if we're working with small unit geographies, um, if they're publishing all the information that they collect on people, it's going to be easy to identify people and identify their personal circumstances. And so to give us that fine resolution information in a way that's somewhat usable, the Census Bureau publishes all of that in those individual responses from its surveys to these public use microdata areas. For our region, these areas do offer us somewhat of a useful geographic framework um, because the city of Buffalo has its own two Puma areas, public use microdata areas, and the border between them is, is Main Street, which is, um, it's not the only border that exists in the city, but it's it's often recognized as a border between um, you know, East and, and West Buffalo. And so we have those two sort of dynamics covered here, even though, again, you don't get that sort of micro level variation that you'd like to have as a neighborhood analyst. Um, beyond that, you have um, Pumas that account for really the inner ring suburbs, singling out Amherst and Williamsville as its own entity. Um, and then you have the outer ring um, of the South Towns, of um, Clarence, Newstead, Lancaster, and, and communities to the east. And then in Niagara County, we have Niagara Falls that's lumped in with some of its surrounding suburbs and then the more rural and, and um, outlying areas to the, to the north and east. So it does give us a, a relatively useful geographic framework, um, but it's one of these data problems. In order to get the fine resolution data that we need to understand people's living circumstances, um, in this case, we're, we're sort of handcuffed to these larger geographic areas. So with that caveat in mind, what does housing cost burden look like when we compute family income for these areas? Um, Region-wide, <coughs> excuse me, over three in 10 households in Buffalo, Niagara are housing cost burden. They struggle with housing unaffordability. Um, that's more than 140,000 households as of the most recent um, Census Bureau American Community Survey data set, which you know, goes up to the year 2019. The traditional census outputs that use household in income underestimate this number by um, around 10,000 households. And so that's, again, the importance of looking at this, this family income of a different way of picturing it. Um, if we look at the city of Buffalo in particular, um, that's where you know, we have these uh, Pumas 1205 and 1206. So 1205 is the east side, 1206 is the west side of Main Street. Um, regardless of, of which side of Main Street an individual is on, um, it's more than four out of every 10 households are cost burdened in the city. So um, while the problem exists, or, or while the, the issue exists everywhere, the phenomenon exists everywhere, it's most prominent in the city of Buffalo. And in Niagara County, it's most prominent in the, the public use microdata area that has Niagara Falls. Um, we do go into in the reports, um, uh, Puma, the, that's the, the term for those public use microdata areas, so I don't have to keep saying that over and over again. Um, but we do do a, a Puma by Puma analysis of housing cost burden by race and gender. Um, that's another one of those unwieldy graphics. And so um, I'll just summarize the, pro, um, the that phenomenon by looking at the regional figures for right now. But you know, we did look at income inequality and the intersections between race, gender, um, and eventually disability status and, and income inequality. And we can see that play out at the regional level. So for the white population, white, non-Hispanic or Latinx population, households headed by such individuals, um, households headed by male individuals in that group, um, only experience housing cost burden you know, less than a fourth of the time. Um, you know, there is a, certainly a gender disparity there, but even um, with that, you, know, you can see that if, if a household's headed by a white individual, they're much less likely to be housing cost burden than any other group inside of the region. The issue becomes 
um, that's the population that's declining. It's the population that's been um, sort of the majority, and so it's probably overrepresented in a lot of positions of power and decision making in the region. Um, and so it's it's a position from which you know we might not see the housing cost burden phenomena as as, uh, as being such a large scale problem. That maybe it's a, a, a an issue that affects a quarter of people or a third of people. But in reality, if you're not a member of that group, um, the problem is much more severe to the point where. Um, for you know, households headed by by Black or African American women, more than half of such households experience housing cost burden. And so, if we're making decisions based on a, a misestimate of what the true extent or scale of the housing cost burden problem is, um, we're not going to be dealing with the inequality that we see in this distribution. And if these populations are the ones that are growing, and we're not you know tackling this affordability issue right now, then it's likely that those affordability issues are going to be exacerbated and increase significantly in scale over time. Um, the next thing that I'll, I'll do is, is sort of a tangent, but it's a meaningful tangent that will have a lot of, of value as we go forward in, in the, the presentation here. But if we break this down by age structure, um, there isn't one set of definitions to define generations, but you know, the, you know there are a lot of popular definitions out there. So. Um, for example, baby boomers are often said to have been born between 1946 and 1964, which would put um, the older members of that generation at 75 years old. So we kind of have this catch all category of individuals over 75. Um, Gen Xers um, are often said to be have been born between 1965 and 1980. Um, millennials, while there are two distinct groups inside that category, um, are those individuals that were born between about 1981 and 1996. And then members of Gen Z are, are those that were born after 1997. Now, why we broke it down like this is because, as in most places, households headed by baby boomers are the, the most numerous category. Um, they're the, the majority or the plurality of the region. They also tend to be uh, the set of households that are the least cost burden um, through a variety of circumstances. Um, you know, when, when they were coming of age in the economy, it was easier to get a job um, in a stronger market or a stronger um, economy with organized labor. It was easy to go out maybe with a high school education and get a job that paid relatively high wages. College education was a lot cheaper. Um, housing was a lot cheaper. And so uh, it got locked into um, housing cost situations where you know over time they became less and less housing cost burden. Um, if you look at how that changes as you move to newer generations, um, while Gen Z households are, are relatively new and are you know, at the high under 24 years old, so it's a relatively small sample, um, you can see a, a tendency emerging um, that younger individuals are more indebted. They're paying much more for college education in much hotter housing markets with much higher prices. Um, and those stagnant wages that we talked about earlier are really coming into play. The more debt you have and the smaller your wages, the more likely you're going to be to be housing cost burdened. And so we're, we see some foreshadowing here where as baby boomers may be approaching retirement ready to sell their homes on a hot housing market, um, this tendency toward housing cost burden is likely to increase. And so this is something to, um, again, keep in the back of your mind as we go forward. I'll, I'll bring this up again um, at another point in time here in the near future. Um, another thing that we can look at is how housing cost burden affects uh, households where persons of, with disabilities live. Um, so in each of these cases, this is broken out by Puma. Um, the left graph for each Puma uh, represents uh, households for which there is at least one person who identifies as having a disability. The right graph is, is persons uh, households where no person identifies as having a disability. Um, and in all cases, the former type of household is at least 10 percentage points more likely than the latter uh, to be housing cost burden. Um, and so in, in the city of Buffalo in particular, over half of all households with persons with disabilities are housing cost burden. Um, so that's a, another way that these uh, um, these phenomena compound and intersect with one another to create inequality and, and to um, you know, really increase the scale and, and um, the magnitude of, of inequality over time. Another issue since, since we're on the topic that's worth examining is that um, households that have persons with disabilities in Buffalo, Niagara, are statistically significantly more likely to be in units that were built prior to 1960. Um, the relevance there is that very few units at that time were built to what we might think of as universal design standards. Very few were even built up to you know, just the, the even weaker ADA standards. 
Um, and so we have you know, folks that are concentrated in units in the city of Buffalo. Um, this is true of, of both groups, but households with this uh, persons with disabilities, more than four out of every five are in a unit that was built prior to 1960. So you know, very unlikely that those units accommodate the needs of, of these households. And so that's another problem um, and challenge that's if the populations of, of persons with disabilities are expanding over time or increasing over time, this issue again becomes more severe as time goes on. Um, so, you know, with all of that being said, clearly cost burden is an issue, especially for historically marginalized populations. So what do we do about it? What's the supply of units that we can look to uh, to hopefully alleviate some of that burden? Conventionally, we look to publicly subsidized housing units. Um, so across the region, we have about 30,000 such units in the two counties of, of Erie and Niagara. Um, the plurality of them are, are units um, that are, are HCV units, housing choice voucher units. Um, so what uh, might have otherwise been private market units out there that um, you know, folks can, can take their vouchers and have subsidized rent at those units. Uh, the next biggest category are project-based Section 8 units and then public housing. So um, units that are, are in public control. Um, now, you know, 30,000 units compared to 140,000 cost burdened household in, households in the region um, sets us up for a big mismatch between supply and demand. And so if we want to quantify this, our goal um, in this study is, is really to, to throw some big numbers at you um, to try to, to just get everyone on the same page of understanding the scale of this issue so that we can coordinate efforts and figure out a way to tackle the, the issue at scale and not just make marginal chips at the edges. All right. So one of the, the or I'd say two of the, the population subgroups that HUD most focuses on when it comes to uh, providing public or, or subsidized housing options are extremely low and very low income households. Now, you know, HUD eligibility goes up to even, even low income households, but um, just to even soften the blow for you a little bit, we'll just focus on those two populations of cost burdened, extremely low income or very low income households. So if we narrow our search down to those types of households, there are 101,400 of them throughout the region um, based on the latest census of subsidized housing um, from HUD or, or picture of subsidized housing from HUD, um, the number of, of extremely and very low income households served by subsidized housing in the region is about 25,000. So about a quarter of households um, that programs might target are actually served, which gives us an excess demand or a shortfall of about 76,000 units. So if you wanna do, you know, understand what that means in your mind, and this comparison is almost exactly to scale. Right, so what we're short is, you know, basically what we have is one M&T Plaza in downtown Buffalo. What we need is the Empire State Building, right? We need about 80 more stories on our building in order to match um, the what, what we might consider the demand from extremely and very low income households for subsidized housing units. Now, that doesn't always mean that we, we need to go out and build, <coughs> excuse me, 76,000 or 80,000 new units. Um, while that might help, um, uh, you know, there are other ways of uh, creating more subsidies that we'll talk about in just a moment or other ways of, of um, making the living situations for household cost burden households um, a little bit better and, and improving that burden or reducing that burden. But why new unit construction needs to be in the mix is that of those 76,000 units, um, you know, about half of them or almost half of them um, would be uh, for households that contain persons with disabilities. And so our units that we have, one of the action items that we recommend in the report is, is an actual census of subsidized units so that we know if they're accessible or not, because right now we don't. That's data that's sort of masked in the grand scheme of things. Um, but you know, given the profile of subsidized units, it's very unlikely that they're built to universal design or other accessibility standards. Um, and so of these 76,000 um, subsidies or, or subsidized units that we're missing, um, you know, about half of those would need to also, ideally all of them, would be built to universal design standards or accessible units. And so that's you know, one reason that construction is, is probably in the mix um, in the, the realm of solutions. All right, so con to continue talking a mile a minute at you since we're time limited, um, right now we're going to go through a nice data thought exercise. Um, and basically the question that we're trying to ask is what would it take to eliminate housing cost burden in the two county region given the data that we just analyzed? Um, so basically, you know, what would it take to make uh, make it so that all households, you know, not just extremely low and very low income households, but all households didn't experience housing cost burden? What would that look like? How much would it cost? 
Um, so to do that in the report, we have all of these um, again, pretty unwieldy, but hopefully informative graphics that um, for every Puma, every public use micro data area, we break it down by the number of bedrooms we need. So zero to one, two or three or more and the type of housing unit. We quantify the number of units that we would need that are currently not affordable that would need to be affordable. And then based on the you know, occupants of those housing units, we look at the median affordable rents for that category. Um, to think about how many units and at what you know average or, or median price points. So as an example of how to read this, um, so the big bar here that we see in Niagara County um, in the, the Puma that contains Niagara Falls is for three plus bedroom, single family detached units, right? And so we have 3,900 of those units right now that are unaffordable for their occupants. The median affordable rents that those occupants could pay would be about $440 per month. If that makes your eyes pop out and you think there's no way that would be profitable, uh, nobody is going, the private market's going to supply that, you're right, right? And that's part of the problem um, is that, you know, we can't really tackle all of these affordability issues by hoping that the private market's going to solve the problem because that price point's not going to earn a profit for a real estate developer. And that's why we need to, uh, again, think about other alternatives as well. But that's how to read these. We have these in the final reports. Um, it would take me another three hours to go through all of these sets of findings um, individually. So um, I'll allow you to engage with, with this thought exercise once you are able to see the written report if you haven't already. But the brass tax here in the bottom line is if we add up all the gaps between what people can afford to pay and what they are paying and add up the number of units, we can put a price tag on what it would take per month to totally wipe out housing cost burden um, in, in all of these public use microdata areas. So in Niagara County, right, if, if we recognize what everyone can actually afford to pay, um, uh, everyone in, in units that are currently unaffordable for them by this housing cost burden metric, it would take up, you know, roughly about $10 million a month to, to totally eliminate housing cost burden. We would be, you know, dealing with about 25,000 units in Niagara County. In the first ring suburbs, so that's um, the Tonawandas, Grand Island gets put in the mix here. Again, that's not our choice. It's just the Census Bureau's drawing of these geographies. Um, Amherst, Williamsville, <clears throat> West Seneca, Cheek, Tawaga. Um, the price tag, you know, with those areas combined is about $21 million per month, you know, dealing with 44,342 units. In the city of Buffalo, about 19 mil over $19 million a month, again, dealing with about 44,000 units. Um, the big needs here are, are really, you know, duplexes are what are mostly unaffordable here. You have fa um, families in duplexes, um, you know, two-bedroom duplexes here that could afford maybe a, a median price of less than $300 per month. Again, you're not going to find um, these types of prices usually supplied by the private market. Um, and then finally, to round things out in the outer ring suburbs, 27,000 units, you know, almost $14 million per month. So if we aggregate that all together for the region, and this is what I said, we, we really do want to make your eyes pop and, and give you these numbers, right? We have 140,626 units that are housing cost burdened to eliminate housing cost burden so that nobody pays more than 30% of their gross monthly income on housing would cost about $64 million per month. You'd be looking at about three quarters of a billion dollars per year in order to eliminate housing cost burden using that 30% metric in the region. Now that, that's equal to an average monthly subsidy of about $454 per cost burden household um, or about $5,460 per year. Now, why I want to bring this up and give you this, you know, these overwhelming numbers is <clears throat> when Jason and I talk about, you know, how, how do we uh, alleviate these problems or, or these challenges, we think of really three big picture strategies. There's uh, many more small picture strategies, but there are three big picture ways. Number one is you can make more public units that are, are controlled, that are, are decommodified or at least partially decommodified and owned by public housing authorities so that tenants aren't paying more than their affordable price for them. So you, you can do that through two methods. You can build more or you can acquire more. Um, in some European countries, including in the UK, um, they're experimenting with innovative uh, right to sell laws where if a home gets in, let's say an underwater mortgage or in a situation where they can't afford to live anymore, they can sell their home to a public housing authority and become a tenant of that public housing authority and pay an affordable price, right? So there are two ways that you can you know, gain more units in your public portfolio. One is by building more, one is by acquiring more. Two, you can subsidize more units. So that means more vouchers basically. Or three, you know, you can pay higher wages. Um, there, there needs to be more income. Now, ideally, all three of those things work together, and and you're not. It's not either or, just one or the other. You're you're doing all um, at at the scale that's needed. 
Um, but you know, those are, are the three you know, different big picture options that we tend to talk about. Now, why I bring up wages is because here's a, another thought exercise for you. Um, imagine what a $2.63 per hour wage increase would do for low income workers to alleviate housing cost burden. I pick that number because you know, generally full time work as depressing as it sounds um, is defined as 2080 hours per year. It's a lot of hours. 2080 hours times $2.63 is $5,470. So on average, right, you'd be taking care of that average subsidy that we just talked about. Now, right now, the minimum wage in upstate New York, including Erie County, is $12.50 per hour. So a $2.63 hour minimum wage increase would make that minimum wage $15.13 per hour, and that would significantly reduce this cost. We didn't do the math on it yet, we can, um, but we didn't do the math on it yet to see exactly how much this number would come down, but that three quarters of a billion dollars per year would come down significantly through a minimum wage increase. Um, and so I know New York is scaling up to $15 per hour, but that's just, again, food for thought. One way that wages can, can make a difference and alleviate um, some of the, the work that's needed in those other strategies of more public units and more subsidized units. Right? So that's um, that, that's really the, the big picture that we try to get at. The last couple of slides that I have for you here just talk about why wages matter. Um, and one is, you know, housing prices have been going you know, really through the roof. There's been a big upward swing in median housing prices, both in single family detached units and in multifamily units in the region. Um, and that's a trend that's, that isn't really showing signs of slowing yet. It's not a bubble that's ready to burst quite yet, you know, given all of, all of the data indicators so far. If we go back to what I said, that average annual wage increase for the region has been over the past few years, it's been at about 1.15%, so really close to 1% per year, um, where housing prices, um, depending on whether it's multifamily or single family, and depending on the area, the Puma, um, have been increasing three to six times as fast as wages. Um, and that's going to create a lot of crunch, a lot of financial hardship for a lot of people that are trying to get in the housing market, particularly those younger generations that are saddled with more debt to begin with. Right? So that's why, why wages matter. Um, and if we try to look at this in perspective, this in perspective these are just a, a couple of, uh, of points to keep in mind. Why are housing prices so high? Well, one is even before COVID, right? COVID hit just at the tail end of this graph. This is the, the inventory, the number of homes for sale in the region. Even before COVID hit, we were on a downswing. The inventory in the region has really dried up um, in many respects. And what that's led to um, is a huge surge in prices. Back in 2012, the fraction of homes that sold above asking price in the region was about 10%. Now it's over half and still increasing. Right, so prices are, are going up. And again, it's, this is something that the data haven't indicated yet that this is a trend that's ready to slow down or stop. Um, we can't project out how long it's going to go or how far how far this this can continue. But right now, the bottom line is that it's a seller's market. And we have a generation of potential sellers in baby boomer headed households that are right now able to afford their homes because they bought their homes for lower prices. And when they put those homes onto the market, even a fraction of them, they're going to benefit from the seller's market. They're going to go on the market at higher prices and they're going to be sold to younger individuals who have more debts, who have stagnant wage jobs perhaps, and who are going to be less uh, in, in less of a, a position to afford, um, to, to afford those homes when they do try to acquire them. And so that um, presumably is going to lead to more affordability issues. So all of that being said, where that all comes to roost is that we have three big conclusions from this report. One is that there's a growing affordability gap, right? We have a seller's market and stagnant wages. And we also have uh, the, the current generation of home buyers and future generations of home buyers um, are experiencing those stagnant wages with higher levels of debt. And so that means that, that those issues of housing cost affordability, of housing cost burden are likely to be on the rise in the near future. Um, and you know that's to speak of a, a looming debt crisis too, not to say that we aren't already in one because we probably are, um, but um, again, just thinking about the potential shift, while there is going to be a lot of aging in place, um, recall that baby boomer headed households are the, the plurality in the region. At least some of those households are likely to sell their homes or um, they're going to pass their homes off to their children who, who might sell those homes because they live elsewhere, they're not here. Um, and so that means that prospective buyers are going to have to take on more debt to be able to afford the, those homes. Um, and that can create potential issues with increased foreclosures. 
And then the last one, I, I know I didn't, uh, I wasn't able to speak to it directly since we don't have great data on it. Um, but the units that we do have, we're in a, a region that has a lot of older housing units that weren't built to current accessibility or, or universal design standards. So they're non-accessible for persons with disabilities and they're relatively inaccessible um, because the new units that we are building that might be you know, built to better standards, better design standards, are largely concentrated in luxury housing in the city, which is expensive and inaccessible to lower income populations, or it's concentrated in the outer rings in larger lot, larger homes that are also at high prices and also inaccessible um, both to low income populations and inaccessible to uh, public transit, to jobs and other amenities. Right? And so those are the big conclusions so far. And what I'm going to do right now is finally shut up and turn it over to my colleague, Jason Knight, who will talk about what this all means and how we move forward from these findings. Thank you, Rossi. I think everyone can hear me, right? Are we good? Um, so first I wanted to just sort of thank, thank Rusty for, for picking up uh, the ball here and running with, with this work this week. I've run into some issues here at home. Um, they sort of threatened my ability to be here today, but Rusty graciously put this presentation together and, and was willing to tackle it all by himself and he, and he pretty much did. Um, second, I kind of want to thank everybody that's in attendance um, for showing up for this important work that, that we've undertaken. Um, it requires a lot of us to work together and, and row together to address some of these issues. And so it's, it's, it's nice and sort of invigorating to see that over 70 regional stakeholders have shown up for, for this critically important work. Um, and the last thing I want to sort of state before I kind of jump into this is that, you know, our work really leverages the work that many of the stakeholders in this in this um, chat and this meeting have, have already undertaken and continue to undertake. Um, we're really here simply to try to build upon the work that you all have done um, and support it in, in the way that we can support it, which is through this type of analysis um, that we've undertaken. So um, I wanted to thank everybody um, for, for being here for that. So. You know, I was just going to go through this really quickly. The main goal of our work here was really to lay out the, the issues that we're seeing in the marketplace, um, given our, our analysis here. Um, and so we sort of didn't really spend a lot of time really, really hashing out the next steps or recommendations here and, and really attack this kind of generally. Um, when we looked at the sort of three tier here approach to, to what might happen next for everybody involved in, in our housing market, um, we, we sort of look at this idea of capacity building and, and policy advocacy and policy change as, as, as two things that really leverage the work that Rusty and I have already done, and that is the analysis of impediments of fair housing choice uh, and the rent study that we, we conducted for, for Erie County. And I know Dr. Taylor's on the call and thank him for, for being here today. Um, he was integral in, the, in getting that project off the ground. Um, you know, the work that is in there and the recommendations and action studies that are in there are really things that LISC and PPG and other stakeholders in the region can sort of lift up um, and advocate for and build capacity around it. So it's not, um, when you read the report, it's not really work in there that's new. It's really just saying we, we have this sort of third um, report here, this, this two county housing needs assessment that really should not be a standalone effort, but should be linked backwards to the work that we've already done so that we're all sort of thinking about what is the, the work that has happened in this region and how do we continue to keep our eye on um, all of this work sort of collectively and together. So that's where those two things um, sort of come into play. So I, I want to spend just a, a brief moment on um, what are some maybe next steps that are research focused and strategic planning focused that um, LISC and other uh, stakeholders can some sort of work on? And this is, again, it's not really well hashed out in the report. It's just sort of bullet item um, steps that, that should be considered. But when we sat down and we thought about what we were coming across with, with our analysis and what we were really coming to understand, um, you know, what, one of the things that we don't really have and I think would be relatively appropriate here is um, and some form of regional housing strategy and action plan that, that, that really captures the work that's been done in these three critical projects and reports uh, and, and trying to tackle them either comprehensively at the regional level by putting everything under one umbrella and one report. Um, and there are other ways it could, you know, we could maybe tackle it in, in bits and pieces, um, thinking through some of these bulleted item um, points that are outlaid on the, uh, on the, on the slide here. So, you know, we we went through this, and, and a lot of us that are in this in this call today recognize that we have some severe challenges in the region when it comes to to housing production. In particular, as it relates to production that happens generally in our first um, ring suburbs, where most of the housing production takes place. Um, you know, 
having a, a, a some understanding of what the regional zoning and development standards look like around the counties um, is critically important. Um, Affordable housing production is something that generally continues to take place in the city of Buffalo. They, um, and I think Keith Lucas is on the call and some others, um, are disproportionately um, sort of tasked with addressing affordability challenges within their own boundaries. Because when we look around our region, uh, what we tend to see is a lot of local design standards, development standards, and in, in zoning codes really restrict the production of affordable housing. Um, through the, the clauses in those in those statutes. So what we tend to see is in some communities, for example, the ones that are particularly growing really, really rapidly right now, um, we see multifamily either absolutely restricted um, or even not even permitted, or it requires a special use permit and that in most cases is arbitrary, which is you have to go in front of a board um, and ask for permission to do something. It's not uh, an at what we would call an as of right use. So um, it, it really restricts the ability to do, you know, multifamily um, housing production in the suburbs. There could be um, places where affordable housing um, gets produced and addresses the, the needs of, of families and households that want to move into communities that are near jobs, that are um, in good quality school districts, that are amenity rich, right? The places that um, we would call sort of neighborhoods of opportunity. The second one is, um, you know, when, when we sat down with for a week long um, series of 11 stakeholder meetings doing the analysis of impediments of fair housing, two groups in particular really highlighted um, the lack of uh, disability accessible housing in our region. And, and over and over and over again, we, we keep sort of kept hearing this, this conversation about disability accessible housing and, and, and sort of gap in the, in the marketplace. And what we don't really have and what we don't really understand is what is the total inventory of that? Um, of that housing type, and then secondarily, you know, what's the geography of that? Because it became clear to us in um, in this conversation that uh, the affordable housing production and then the disability housing production system is intrinsically linked to the transportation needs, in particular public transportation. And so, um, so when we think about inventory and the the total number of the total. Um, stock of disability accessible housing. We're really interested not just in the total number, but also how close they are to bus stops and bus routes, right? A, a critically important component of, of that. And so, you know, really for if, if we're thinking about how do we tackle that and, and address um, this gap, we need to understand first what we have and then see, and then secondarily, what, how do we plan to, to, to produce more and where do we do that? Um, Rusty mentioned in the in the presentation that we have, um, you know, we have a, a sort of count of, of subsidized housing units in, in Erie County. Um, in Niagara County, uh, we're sort of making the, the point that you know there is a there is a number of uh, of uninhabited um, subsidized units. So an inventory and census of subsidized housing units would would tell us a where those units are. Um, B when looking at those units and, and existing wait list, what can we um, how can we match up how affordable housing um, needs with the, the, the sort of available units we have in the marketplace, um, and then the last. Sort of two key points before we get to the last one is um, that I think this we get asked two really common questions all the time when we we talk to stakeholders and housing organizations and and, and and others in the region about housing in general and I would say the second most popular question is do you have data on housing condition and the answer is usually no we don't um, there is some data in the city's housing opportunity strategy that that, that um, sort of rates housing in the city on a one through five scale, um, but that doesn't tell us a lot about what's happening in the suburbs. Um, and again, back to the analysis of impediment stakeholder meetings, one of the things that was really eye-opening for us was talking to many of you in this, in today's meeting about the quality uh, and condition of, of housing that, that are, in particular are low, moderate income households tend to get um, burdened by the disproportionately high cost for disproportionately low quality housing. Um, and so, Having an understanding of what the conditions of housing are across the region um, would allow us to really think better about how we are doing code enforcement for first and foremost, which is are we are we really efficient and effective and equitable as it, as it comes to as it comes to code enforcement, which is a critical role of local governments, um, which is are we doing what's necessary to make sure that people live in quality housing that meets you know generally acceptable standards and, and but also the New York State Building Code standards and those types of things. Um, and it turns out that over and over and over again, that becomes our sort of second most popular question or, or, or task or, or ask from others. The, the first one is actually the second 
bold item, which is over and over and over again, we get asked, um, where is publicly owned land and how do we acquire it? Um, I don't know why we get asked that question a lot, but it is asked a lot. It could be that we've worked in that arena in some way, shape or form. Um, and our point always and continues to be that the inventory of, of public owned land in our region, whether that is in the city of Buffalo or any of our suburban communities, we continue to advocate that that is our greatest asset in addressing many of the housing needs um, in our in our region. So really understanding both the inventory, the total number, but also the geography of, the, of those units is critically important to allow us to develop, develop strategies around how it is we address the housing gaps and housing needs that we've seen Rusty present um, in the last hour in this, in this, in this meeting. So <laughs> that brings us to this last, what I would consider to be a synthetic point, right? And, you know, Rusty and I are trained geographers, if that means anything to anybody, if it even means anything to us. Um, you know, when we think about housing, we think about it primarily um, from a geographic perspective. Um, and so in many ways that we've undertaken housing production, particularly as, as it relates to housing that is subsidized in some way, shape or form, um, around the idea that we put it in the places where we can easily or cheaply or both acquire land. Invariably, that means that we build housing, whatever type of housing it is, in neighborhoods that many people would argue aren't the best locations for the people that we're trying to house. So thinking about all the layers of data that we have accessible to us and the way that we think about um, housing production, a really good geographic suitability analysis of all available land, whether that is public or privately held vacant land, um, and overlaying that land um, sort of layer, if you will, with other variables that are critically important, like transportation routes, school districts, um, you know, fresh food um, stores, those types of things, would really allow us to think, I think, more rationally and more critically about where it is that we are producing or we seek to produce housing as we move forward. Um, so, you know, affordable housing um, groups want their their tenants and their their um, their communities to, to live in places that are near bus routes to get them to jobs and maybe has access to fresh fruits and vegetables, right? Um, those that need disability accessible housing need to be within, I think the number, if I recall correctly, is a quarter mile um, of an existing bus stop so that they can rely on paratransit if that's, um, if that's a need. And so thinking about all of these issues is important, but I think, you know, again, Rusty and I sort of think about this in a geographic perspective, really thinking about how it is that we tackle this issue in a way that is strategically geographic so that when we make decisions about how we move forward, we're doing it not just on the sort of standard position of what's the cheapest land we can get our hands on, um, but what is the best place that we can build housing in our in our region and our communities um, so that we do that in a way that is, um, is, is equitable from the, from the, from the outset. Um, and so those are the things that are, you know, again, we Rusty pointed to the, to the report and I think it's, there's not much detail beyond that, just sort of some ideas that sort of, I think our hope is to incubate a secondary conversation and around what do we do now um, and where, where this project goes from here. So that's kind of where um, we sort of leave it um, in, in, uh, in, the, in the report and, and try to get ourselves um, moving to a, a, a next step sort of situation. So um, I just want to um, sort of end there and maybe I think Julie, I think our goal now is maybe do we take some questions if, if that's what you um, sort of want to want to kick it off from this point. We're, we're certainly willing to uh, to do that. Just Rusty, I just stole your host role from the uh, process. Um, I do want to give a couple. Thank you both. I think for this incredibly rich presentation. Um, in the WebEx format on the right hand side of your screen, uh, there is a question and answer format. Um, I'm still working to see it actually mute everyone, but in the event I cannot, um, please feel free. We've had a couple of questions already. Um, before we jump to them, I want to lift up a couple of clear follow ups. First, um, this is an enormous problem. Um, if we take the average cost of housing plus these pieces, the, the information that Rusty gave us earlier in terms of possible scenarios, this is both a scale in terms of the number of, of units and the dollar figures that we really just have not explored as a region uh, to the best of my knowledge. Um, and I want to apologize to any of the amazing housing professionals who um, 
we're looking at this at scale in previous iterations. Um, I just haven't seen updated data like this uh, in my professional practice. Um, we're also looking across a larger geography, which means we're recognizing that this is not just a city of Buffalo issue um, and that we as a region really need to be exploring how we get solutions that um, recognize a wide range of housing choices um, and opportunities for, for everyone involved. And I think this one in per this study in particular lifts up disability uh, concerns in a way that um, it really uh, allows a refocusing and consideration and elevation of universal access. Uh, throughout any of the solution opportunities. After this uh, meeting, you will be getting a WebEx survey and it will uh, ask for your name, your organization, uh, and, a, and some questions about uh, whether or not you'd like to be involved in a process uh, and really a deep conversation moving forward around solutions. It will require us to examine what we can solve with things like income uh, increases and to the minimum wage, to prevailing wage, to um, to other programs. It will require us to look at different financing vehicles and obstacles and how do we leverage things like closing the appraisal gap um, and other barriers to home ownership to really make sure that any solutions are equitable uh, and really wealth creating for the region. Um, it will require us to look at new housing solutions. The cost of lumber and other labor uh, uh, costs have independent of the other factors revealed here. Uh, caused a skyrocket uh, in the cost of housing uh, and new construction. And so we really do need to look at innovation around all of the ways that we're influencing housing. Um, and LISC is working with several partners on a couple of those fronts. So that having been said, we invite this to, we invite us to spend the rest of the time together uh, responding to the questions that we have today, but also um, invite you to get involved with us after uh, the presentation on a much uh, longer discussion around solutions. Um, if we're dealing with 75,000 units, 76, um, and you can think about your own career and your own lifetime, um, think about how many units we'd actually have to be addressing, how many people, 75 units is about 150,000 people, how many people we'd really like to impact over our professional lifetimes, over our work and community. So with that, I'm going to lift up just a couple of questions we had in the chat. I'm going to see if I can um, grab them all. It's a little bit of a funny space. Blythe, um, Merrill had a question about um, the role of advanced manufacturing in the list of um, industries. Um, Blythe, I'm just looking to see if I can grab the whole scroll, see if I can get it here. My Q&A. Oh. Uh, I wonder if I can unmute you and have you lift up your question directly. Just a minute. Okay. Okay. I'm going to see if I can. That's um, I apologize for the delay in this question process. Actually, let me just read the question for you here. Life's question was, um, was advanced manufacturing high area of employment need for the region. Jason or Rusty? Yeah, I, I can speak to that. So, um, and, and it's kind of a, a cop out, so I apologize, but it's one of those things where um, I think we need a, a workforce and an economic study to, to supplement a housing study. Um, we sort of looked at the, the picture that we could latch on to with data um, and look at what our labor economists for the region have projected are, are growing regions based on recent uh, uh, recent business growth and, and recent patterns of job growth. Um, and so advanced manufacturing wasn't necessarily part of, of that projected growth because of recent trends. Um, however, um, you know, with something like a, a new infrastructure bill pending um, and the direction that uh, the current you know, federal administration wants the, the economy to go in even, um, that's going to be part of hopefully the, the region's future. And so that's something that's um, we almost need a, a workforce development study as well to think about what it would take. Um, and I, I hate this game and I hate even saying these words, but what it would take to incentivize um, you know, firms to, to come in and create those types of jobs and put us on a path um, to expanding the footprint of that industry in the region. Muted, sorry. John's question, how much is the monthly child tax credit that will start this summer and what mean for a family as an example? 
Senator Rusty? So, yeah, so the, the monthly uh, child tax credits, it, it is set to kick off, I want to say July 15th, maybe. Um, and it will be distributed monthly as long as you filed your tax return. Um, I think it's it's something around uh, $300 per month. I don't know if that's per child or per household, um, but the I mean, the projections on that are that's nationwide, um, that it would cut child poverty in half. Um, now, of course, you have to remember that's a, a temporary program that's set to expire at the end of 2022. And so um, that's a, a, a maybe a, a short term fix, but that's you know, also something that probably deserves to be institutionalized and become permanent um, if, if it does all the, the wonderful things that it's going to do. So um, for us as a region, it will alleviate the burdens that we just talked about in our slides. Um, but we also need to have our eye to the fact that right now, barring any other federal action, it's a temporary program that will expire. Um, and so it's a, a, a stopgap, um, but you know, efforts to, to make something like that permanent are still going to be needed. <clears throat> Our next questions are from John Washington. He's asking, is there any data or thoughts about stability subsidized housing, about the stability subsidized housing, how it makes people transient and susceptible to changes in income? How do we create more stability in neighborhood populations? Uh, that's a, a great question, um, and anybody on the call, in, including John or Julie, you that have um, ideas or recommendations around that, we would love to include them. Um, that's that's one thing. I mean, we can look at the, the data and sort of report back what we find. Um, but in terms of of you know creating stabilized populations and um, you know it, just to you know generally improving quality of life and putting us on a different trajectory. Um, those are parts of the actions and solutions that we're hoping uh, get discussed and emerge from you know recognizing what the scale of the problem is and 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 where we are. Um, so yeah, I would love to be part of those solutions conversations. Unfortunately, I just don't have the the concrete answers for that. John, I would just say that there are a number of community stakeholders and organizational partners that are looking at opportunities to either um, repeat Maintain and or preserve subsidies uh, connected with locations to help support neighborhoods. Um, and that could be something like the community land trust model and or rent to own uh, pathways um, connected with uh, subsidized programs. I think both uh, pathways as well as many others um, can and should be explored as we look at solutions for this larger uh, program. Certainly, we don't want to have spent an enormous amount of money addressing rent. Uh, without also trying to create and overcome uh, some of the region's tremendous racial uh, home ownership wealth gap. Excuse me. Um, John, you had a follow. I'm going to go to a question from Lori and then I'll come back to your second question. Um, Lori Stillwell uh, says that Rusty mentioned they can do the math on how an increase in two, of $2.63 per hour would um, reduce the need for affordable housing units. Um, she would love to see what effect that would have. And um, I think that we, Rusty, I think that we could probably get that uh, an early or high level analysis on that done completed before the final report release. Can you just verify? Yeah, yeah, I, I will plan on uh, roping that into the final, uh, the final report. One reason that we didn't, um, just to, to be quite honest, the Census Bureau reports um, the number of hours and the number of weeks that people work in, in a very weird way. They do it in bins. And so it takes us um, a little bit of statistical analysis to actually estimate people's hourly wages. You know, um, the Bureau doesn't report on hourly wages, just annual sums. And then they give us an idea of how many hours people work in a year. And so we have to do um, a little bit of analysis to support that. That wasn't part of this initial uh, turn in of, of this draft report, but we'll move forward with, with plans to do that for sure. A follow up question. Actually, I'm going to go to Diane Bessel, who is asking about thoughts on repair and renovation of existing housing stock within Buffalo, Niagara Falls, et cetera. So that um, I'll ask uh, maybe Jason can comment on it. I, I know one of our colleagues for the um, housing opportunity study did something like that in the city of Buffalo and, and uh, put an equally large number out there for what it would take to rehab a lot of units. But that's something that was specific to Buffalo and, and did not include um, the rest of the region. And so, um, unfortunately, I, I hate, you know, being a, a broken record and saying, but that would almost require a, a separate study to focus um, specifically on that issue. But Jason, maybe you can share uh, what the total was for the city of Buffalo on that. Yeah, I, I, and I'm sure there's somebody from the city, if Keith may be still here, I, you know, the number that I had heard from the consultant was, you know, somewhere in, on the order of a billion dollars to, to 
to do housing production that would sort of fulfill the need on the on the east side or citywide. Um, and you know, one of the I think you know back in the chat, I think Helene raised a question about housing shortages or or a wage problem as a as a question she left in the chat, and I think that sort of gets into the same sort of conversation, which is. Um, you know, it's a sort of chicken or egg question. Do we have a housing shortage, which I would argue we we don't. We have a um, we do have more of a, a wage problem in the region. And, and Lori's point about you know doing the math to, to extrapolate out what two sixty three an hour um, would mean, I think, hits to the heart of that that challenge we have with with wages. Um, and you know, even John's sort of second question about the housing boom. Um, I think one of the challenges we're going to see, I, I would expect to see, is as the overall housing boom, if you will, sort of the, the rise in prices drags up the rise in, in prices for all units. And that's just going to make the affordability issue, I think, a little bit more um, challenging, maybe beyond what we can expect right now, because um, all, all, all units in the region are going up, not just the ones that are being sold. So um, the value of, of rent in the city and in the suburbs should, should increase too. So as long as we have a relatively stagnant wage problem in an a, a economy that produces those, those types of jobs, we're going to continue to have a, 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 wage, a wage challenge um, that, that exacerbates or manifests in, a, in an affordability challenge. Jason, we had a question um, and, and Rusty from Henry Taylor about the differences in income between owners and renters. And I know that a portion of the study looked at um, housing uh, burden, or I should say rent burden, uh, um, and the differences between renters and home ownership. Um, I wonder if you could speak to that a bit uh, quickly. Uh, sure. In fact, if you give me a moment, so that, that does feature in the report, unfortunately. Um, I don't know if I was a good editor or not, and, and the cuts that I made in order to, to meet our time, if they were the correct ones, but we do have a, a section on that in the report. Um, and I'm just looking to see if I can bring up a visualization here um, that might be able to speak to that question a little bit more directly. Um, as always on, on a live call like this, my, <laughs> my software is locking up and uh, being a, a little bit troublesome, but give me a moment here. I, I may be able to bring that up. Okay, well, um, Rusty works on that. Um, I do, I can lift up another question. Um, Keith Lucas was verifying 600 million to bring all city properties up to basic standards in 2017 dollars. Thank you, Keith. Um, I think that Elena Falikoff also from the city was saying an analysis of housing construction repair industry would be useful if we were to receive substantial funds for construction repair to expand the number of habitable and affordable units. I think we would struggle to find contractors to perform the work. Um, Anna um, Lisk is absolutely um, uh, agrees and has uh, under the leadership of our deputy director Tyra Johnson Hux. Um, has been in some early conversations around uh, how any housing and or large scale construction effort could really involve in wealth building and income opportunities within the construction trades. Um, so uh, not to interrupt, but I'll just show. So the, the distribution of income by tenure um, versus uh, whose housing cost burden and who's not is, is almost what you would expect it to be with renters. Um, adding sort of another layer, another intersection to that inequality that we uh, we're talking about before uh, that even among cost burdened households, whether they own or rent, uh, renters are twice as likely basically in most cases to be extremely low income um, or to exist sort of on the, the left and the low end of the income spectrum. So, um, you know, it's, it's very much um, in, uh, a problem for everybody, but cost burden is disproportionately a renter problem in, in the city. So um, we do include both uh, uh, the underlying data and graphics for this in the, the report. So that should be there um, in the end. I want to lift up Andrea Harley has um, submitted a number of um, information points and questions through the chat, um, largely uh, lifting up the, the particular crisis circumstances associated with the past year and COVID and everything from um, kind of immediate uh, rent burdens to changes in landlords and partnerships um, and potential eviction vulnerabilities. Um, I think that there is, we're looking both at the acute response as well as how we um, look at some of these longer term investments because regrettably outside of the larger stimulus package, um, many of these larger housing tools and production methods um, will take probably in likelihood take a year or two to kind of get lined up. Um, and 
we know that a lot of that vulnerability around eviction is going to be impacting people right now, which is why some of the um, the rent relief uh, pieces have really been critical. And uh, with so many of the partners in the continuum of care system have really been doing tremendous work under COVID um, on behalf of our entire community and, and have been that frontline work has been invaluable uh, for our entire community this year. Um, I'm looking to see if I have other questions in the chat, um, asking the panelists. Um, I know Kevin Connors has said, would it be safe to assume that all major new projects should include low or mixed income accessible housing um, and or can the next steps increase home ownership and wealth building? Um, do Jason or Rusty want to take a stab at either of those policy questions? Yeah, I think the home ownership question is, is always an interesting one and usually first and foremost in a lot of conversations about um, increasing ownership. But the challenge with increasing ownership is, um, you know, what's the quality and condition of the houses we put new homeowners in, right? And do we burden them with taking the lowest quality stock because it's the cheapest price and then we hand them something that needs constant updating and maintenance and costs associated with it that they might not be able to do their on their own sort of DIY it or they may not get the money from the bank to do it because it's not in the neighborhood the bank is willing to lend in. So I you know I always I always kind of caution us around the idea of home ownership and if it's just going to be hey we have these units that we can get you access to relatively cheaply but um, the systems and structures have to be in place to support that ownership after the fact it can't just be a sort of transactional relationship. So I think that's critically important and I think for backing up to the conversation about costs of lumber and labor, um, you know, I have a lot of friends and family who work in the in the in the trades in this region. Um, you know, I'm just a blue collar Tanawanda kid um, in, in in this region. So, um, you know, I have a lot of friends that are still in that, and they can't find labor right now. Um, and so, I think what we should expect is, you know, we need some increase in the sort of training in the in the in the, in the trades in the region to support support that. Um, but I also think we're seeing a, a massive ramp up in, in in those types of uh, projects right now, a lot of home renovations and things like that because the market is so sort of kinked. Um, but the the lumber the lumber question, which is one I follow sort of you know in a, in a kind of um, anecdotal way, just trying to keep up the, the the issue with lumber. I think we should expect lumber prices to come down rather substantially probably by next year. Um, but that does so that should you know the the material cost can be reduced um, down the road. But the but the short term labor question, the labor um, demand is is where our biggest challenge might be if we get into sort of production production cycle down the road. I do want to just mention that I want to. We've had a number of great questions in the chat. I know that we were at a high of eighty one participants this afternoon. We've lost about about twenty five of those participants. You know, it's a two hour webinar on a Thursday before a holiday weekend, so we're going to assume that everyone had to go for other reasons and conflicts. Um, I will remind you that we are preserving the chat. We are going to look at how we can answer all of your questions or at least bookmark them for deeper exploration um, in one of those more focused conversations as a next step. Um, again, Henry Taylor was lifting up um, increases in public housing, but uh, recognized the need um, and the challenge of providing significant uh, sufficient maintenance dollars for public housing units. Um, this is similar um, within the entire spectrum of uh, housing, whether or not it's home ownership, uh, home, uh, whoever owns the units, including nonprofits, public and or private um, entities, you know, the ability to really consider life cycle costs and what it takes to maintain housing so that it's not deteriorating, it's staying in healthy conditions um, is, is ubiquitous throughout the field. We're seeing it in, in many, many sectors. And so, um, adding to the cost uh, uh, and, and the real cost of what it means to own and, and create housing within the region. So an excellent point to, to weave throughout. Um, I'm looking for other questions. If we haven't lifted them up, um, I would ask Rusty or Jason, um, any other um, kind of dimensions or, or challenges here that you may want to, to kind of introduce before we wrap it up for the day? No, I think, you know, one of the Rusty always makes a good point and, and we always think about when we have these types of meetings, we always have the questions that are um, immediate, right? The, the, the stakeholders, the people that are working on the ground have these immediate concerns and questions that we can't answer or can't help with, right? So we tend to look at everyone that's doing basically yeoman's work in our community in the housing industry and, and, 
and community development as sort of firefighters, right? On a day-to-day -day basis, they're constantly putting out fires. Um, and we look at ourselves in many ways and work like this as sort of fire prevention. We're looking long-term and down the road, um, trying to support it so that we can make sure that we avoid the fires when they happen in two, five, and 10 years. Um, so, you know, we're, we're always looking to sort of contribute to the long-term view of, uh, of this type of work when we can. And then there's been opportunities where we've had where we've worked directly with organizations on the day-to-day. Um, so, you know, our, our point is that this, this, this project and this report is really hopefully um, going to give us some things to think about as we move forward and, and try to address the systemic problems that we have in the marketplace. Um, but we recognize that the work that everyone does on a day-to-day -day basis is well beyond um, what we can really help with like today, right? So and, and we sort of, you know, applaud the work that everyone does in that, in that arena. Um, and, and, and like I said earlier, we're just kind of here to try to support support them in any way we can. Well, I want to take the go ahead, uh, Rusty. Did you have any final points before we wrap things up? No, no. I, I'll just echo everything Jason just said, and I'm sure everyone's heard enough of my voice today. So, um, thank you for for being here, and thank you for having us. I want to thank everyone who supported LISC and PPG um, and the researchers throughout this process. I want to recognize that the funding for this project came through a HUD Section 4 capacity building grant, really looking at how this data can help support the affordable housing community and ecosystem in Western New York. Uh, I want to invite everyone and remind you again, if you have any questions that weren't answered, you can email us, you can put them in the chat, you can answer the survey. Um, this is the beginning of what we hope will be a very meaningful uh, and, and, and complex engagement over the next um, several months. It's not an easy lift to try to imagine a solution uh, to this, uh, to the enormity of this problem, and yet um, it is affecting the health, the income, the stability, the learning capabilities, the the. Um, the tenure, uh, the employee performance of every individual uh, in our community in terms of having healthy, safe, affordable housing, um, and certainly um, a, a really smart investment towards uh, closing the, the racial health, income, and wealth gap. Um, we look forward to collaborating with each and every one of you. Um, we look forward to continuing to learn from uh, each and every one of you um, and are open to both sharing this information. This was recorded. We'll try to get the presentation up on the website as quickly as possible um, and working with you to finalize the report and, and, uh, and, and find a pathway on solutions. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we really appreciate your making the time. Thank you.